We offer hope this hour, the blessed hope. And he says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and take you where I am. Can I change the word a little bit? I'm going to come back and get you and take you where I've been. How's that? I've been preparing a place for you. It's in heaven. If you don't believe in a rapture, if you say there is no rapture, then take a pair of scissors and cut John 14, 1, 2, and 3 right out of your Bible. It's that serious. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. We offer you an hour of encouragement today. We talk about an imminent event known as the Rapture of the Church. Here is Jan Markell. And welcome to the program. Say we're going to take a break from some of the, well, troubling issues we've looked at recently. And we're going to play Pastor Jack Hibbs' conference message from Understanding the Times 2019. What you believe about the rapture and why it matters. So let's head right over to Jack Hibbs back on September 21st, 2019. Hey, I'm going to ask you to stand if you would and open your Bibles this afternoon. Stand and open your Bibles. And I'm going to ask you to turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. We're going to do this. Hopefully the screens are going to be working okay. And um, we're going to read verses 3 to 4. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version Bible. And if you don't have that version, we need you to get a real Bible. I'm just joking. (laughs) No, no, no. But listen, on the screen, if you don't have that version, that's okay. Uh, look to the screen, and we'll do our responsive reading. How many of you listen to any of the messages at Chino Hills or anywhere like that? Okay, so we're going to have church today, right? I know it's not Sunday. We're just going to do it like we do it at home, and this is what we do at home. So I'm going to begin by reading the odd-numbered verse. If you'll join with one another on the screens, even the e- reading the even-numbered verse, uh, we'll do this together. Colossians chapter 3. Are you ready? I'm going to begin. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Wow, you should hear you. (laughs) For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Hey, listen, before we pray again, look at that last statement. Then you also will appear with him in glory. Listen, yes. <laughs> hey, can we, um, can we lift our hands in prayer? I know you can do it. It doesn't make the prayer any special. It just looks really awesome. <laughs> you ready? Father, we pray that you would be the one who would not only deliver this message today, but you would be the one who by your grace grants us to be students of your word. In this gathering, we could easily be fixated on one diet, and that diet would be Bible prophecy, but your word gives us Bible prophecy that we might trust and believe the rest of it. May we live all of it So we invite the presence of your Holy Spirit here today. May we leave this conference this afternoon or evening changed people. No matter who or how we've come into this place, may we leave changed. We know that that's your will, and we know that you answer prayers that are in accordance with your will. So we ask it in Jesus' name, and again, all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated, and Jan has asked me to... In fact, only Jan could do this to me. <laughs> I, I, in 30 years of pulpit ministry, I've never preached the same message twice. I just have never been allowed to do that by God. It's just never been allowed uh, for him to, it, it just doesn't work for me. And, uh, and Jan asked me some time ago, she said, you know, the next time we're together in Minnesota, will you Will you give this message? I don't remember exactly where Jan heard it. I think it might have been Toronto. But So for those of you, I met some people from Toronto. You can, you'll be excused. You can sleep during this message. You've already heard it. But I want to be honest and direct and 
of course, spirit-led and biblical, and I say that just to preface that I will probably get passionate about this. It's my, it's my hope. It's what I'm living for. I, I love the fact that the rapture is a clear doctrine in the Bible, and yet today there are people saying, no, it's not. You saw that clip, tragically, by Hank Hennegraff, who he's not telling you his other agenda and his view of theology, which would explain everything. But we need to be encouraged when we hear things like that. I mean it. I'm not joking. The Bible warns us that in the last days, scoffers would come, mocking the promise of his coming. What is incumbent upon you and I is to not be swayed or persuaded by their voice or their fanciful books or their name and ministry. Watch out. The Bible warns and says that men from among us will rise up in the last days and deceive. Are you ready for that? Listen, men will rise up from your church and in your movement and your denomination, the Bible says, and they will deceive. So we need to be careful that we're not swayed by someone's face or name, but by the truth that comes out of their life. I mean that, out of their life. What they say is what they live. I don't care about what you say. I want to know if what you say is what you live then it's truth. If it's not lived out in truth, then it's only a theory. And the last thing the church needs is theologians. We've had enough of that. We need people who are going to live out the gospel. And that's the call upon God today. So today we're looking at a message entitled, What You Believe About the Rapture Matters. What you believe about the rapture matters. And we're going to be looking at many scriptures, so take notes, please. But the fact of the matter is, for all of us that have come here today, and I love the theme, by the way, of Amir's conferences that he takes all over the world, awaiting his return, awaiting his return. I've always signed my emails at the end or my letters at the end, awaiting his return. That's what we're living for, and we get that out of the Bible. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible there tells us that we're to be looking That implies waiting with eagerness for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a verse. It's an argument not only for the deity of Jesus Christ. He's our great God and Savior. Who is it? Jesus Christ. But he's coming back. I love that. And a moment ago we read in Colossians about you and I being believers and being ready to meet him in glory. And there are four things that you saw as your Bible is open there in Colossians 3 is the fact that you saw this. Seek those things which are above. Jack, what do I do as I believe the Lord's coming back and he could come back at any time, but what if he doesn't come back for the next 10 years or the next 50 years? Listen, you need to be ready for Jesus today and you need to be planning and occupying till he comes. When will that be? I don't know. But I'm going to be ready by his grace. How do you do that? Number one, mark it down, seek those things which are above. And all that you do, seek those things that are above. And all of your Christian discipline and your following of Jesus, this is your marching orders for an end time church. Seek those things that are above. Pastors in your churches need to seek those things that are above. Your board of elders, your ushers, your associate ministers, every church, imagine all of the churches that are represented here this afternoon, We are commanded in Scripture to seek those things that are above, not not what's on the internet, not what's trending, not what's cool. Seek those things that are above. Secondly, you're to set your mind on the things that are above. Then the Bible tells us we'll be ready because it says when Christ who is our life appears, church, listen today, is Christ your life? Is he the one that has given you life? Listen, have you suffered How many of you have suffered? Raise your hands. You've suffered. Okay, no, put your hands down. That's not enough. (laughs) Listen, suffering is a blessing. Jesus suffered. You say, how can you say that? Because it's true. Our God is so real that even suffering is a blessing. The world suffers. But when the Christian suffers, we're drawn closer into the arms of Jesus. When, When Listen, when we suffer, he's there in power. And I love the fact that when Christ, who is our life, appears. Notice the word is an appearance. He's going to appear. Does that ring true to the Bible? We'll see today. 
And then it says, then you will also appear with him in glory. Where in the world is there in the Bible an event that allows and affords you to appear with Christ in glory? Think of it. Colossians chapter 3 right here tells you that there's going to be an event that takes place that you are going to be gathered to Christ and you're going to appear with him in glory. Number one, mark it down in your notes. Number one, what you believe about the rapture matters because the rapture is a biblical doctrine. Will you mark that down? It is a biblical doctrine. That phone call to the Bible Answer Man program, was it was a phone call made by the uninformed and it was an answer given by the uninformed. The Bible clearly teaches rapture. See, rapture doesn't, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Of course it's not in the English Bible. It's not in the Russian Bible either. Listen, it, it's not in the Portuguese Bible. I've got a Hawaiian Bible. It's not in the Hawaiian Bible. The word rapture is Latin. The word rapture appears in the Latin Bible. So when somebody says, well, it doesn't appear in the Bible, it doesn't appear in your English Bible, but if you, if you have a Latin Bible, it appears in the Latin Bible. So don't let that be said anymore. And the word rapture means to be wrapped, caught, pulled up suddenly. It means to be taken from one place unto another place. For, for example, Philip, remember in the book of Acts, Philip was ministering, ministering, and the Bible says that he was caught up by the Holy Spirit and deposited in another place. That was a rapture. Elijah was raptured. Remember Elijah was taken up in a flaming chariot up into the heavens? Anybody know who Enoch is? What happened to Enoch? Enoch, Enoch walked around for thousands of years ago. Enoch walked around saying uh, the word that I grew up on at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa in the 70s. Maranatha. Remember that, anybody? Maranatha. What, it was one finger. Maranatha. Maranatha. What was it? Behold, the Lord cometh. That was the word of Enoch, and the Bible tells us that Enoch was walking on earth, and then Enoch was not, because God raptured him up, caught him up, took him away. It's a biblical doctrine, introduced by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Write down the verse, John 14, verses 1 to 3. John 14, verses 1 to 3. Your friends, maybe you're here today, you don't believe in the rapture, then figure this out, please. John 14, 1, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, singular, are many mansions, plural. In other words, one house, many dwelling places. So church, take that finger you stuck up a moment ago. Where's the Father's house? Point to it. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. When Jesus ascended, did he go up or did he go sideways? Did he go down? He went up. To prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Church, listen to that. You just read Colossians 3, who said he's going to appear, and you are going to be with him in glory. Jesus says in John 14, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you, I bet it's glorious, Chip and Joanna Gaines ain't done nothing compared to what Jesus is doing. And he says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and take you where I am. Can I change the word a little bit? I'm going to come back and get you and take you where I've been. How's that? I've been preparing a place for you. It's in heaven. If you don't believe in a rapture, if you say there is no rapture, then take a pair of scissors and cut John 14, 1, 2, and 3 right out of your Bible. It's that serious. Every pulpit, listen, every pulpit must teach the rapture of the church. I am not here to persuade the timing of the rapture. Nobody knows the timing, but if you are pre-trib, if you're mid-trib, pre-raph, post-trib, you know what? We can have our debates. I'm super, I used to be, I was pre, then I was post, and now I'm super pre. <laughs> I was pre because my pastor was pre and then I got an attitude and then I thought I know better than he does and then I went post and that was really hard to do because you got to twist the scriptures. I got to tell you, you got to bend the Bible around to be a poster. And then I, and then I, went, I just went back to taking the Bible literally because it's a biblical doctrine. It's easy. It fits. It was the hope of Paul the apostle. It's the hope taught by Jesus. 
So Paul shows up. I can't wait. I'm going to be there in a few weeks in the region of the Adriatic. And Paul was up in the area of uh, Thessalonica. And he was only there, our theologians tell us, from three to four weeks. He went there and spoke, and there was a church that was started. And Paul, the apostle, taught the Thessalonians two key doctrines. Are you ready for this? 2,000 years ago, he taught them regarding the security of their salvation. And he taught, th he taught, the, he taught the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians the doctrine of his imminent return. It's found in 1 Thessalonians. I'm not making it up. It's a fact. It's a theological truth. 2,000 years ago, Paul thought that those two doctrines were important. I would submit to you today that they're more important now than they ever have been. We're 21 centuries removed. Having said that, we may differ on the timing, but I don't know of any Christian that says there is no rapture. You may be a poster, a mid, or a pre, but I don't know anybody reading their Bible says there is no rapture. That would be, I believe, heresy. The pulpit needs to be clear on this. Pastors need to teach on it. Everybody wants to learn about it. Look at the crowd that's in here today. In the distance, I met someone who just drove 14 hours from Canada. Why? Hungry for hope. Hungry for truth. Hungry for light. Hungry for the word. Pastors need to teach it. Imagine. Imagine. People would be filled with hope again. Yeah, but you know what? Their heads would be stuck in the clouds and they would be no earthly good. Oh, come on. The church needs to become heavenly minded so it becomes earthly good for crying out loud. But in all, listen, in all five chapters of 1 Thessalonians, we'll run through it really quick. Are you ready? I'm going to go fast. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Guess what the word wrath means? The indignation of God, the anger, the judgment of God. It has nothing to do with hell. This is a verse that has to do with the wrath of God being poured out on earth. Guess what? The Bible in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says that we're to wait because we're going to be, del be delivered from the wrath that is going to be poured out upon a Christ rejecting world. Not my opinion. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? 1 Thessalonians 3.13 So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Do you know anyone who died believing in Jesus? Raise your hand. You have family members, friends up there? Now hang on to that verse, 1 Thessalonians 3.13. You say, wait a minute, the saints, he's going to come with the saints, what's all that? Hey, listen, there are saints in the church age that are in heaven, and there are saints here in this grand sanctuary today. Did you know that? Saints. Now let's just see if that's true. Next chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, church, do we? Yes. That's really sad. Can we do that again? Yes. If No, let's wait. Let's back up because we'll edit it and make you guys look really good for... Okay, so, okay. Okay, go. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, church, do we? Wow, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Sleep in Jesus means that their body took on the appearance of sleep when they died. It's a very affectionate first century mention of the believer when they die. By the way, it's true of the Old Testament saints. Remember, for example, the Bible says, God said to Daniel, you are going to sleep or you're going to go to your fathers. You're going to rest with your fathers. You're going to sleep with your fathers. It means that the believer takes on the appearance of death in the body. It was never spoken of your soul, of your spirit. Your body looks like it sleeps in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we, Paul said we, he didn't say them, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Then what? Their bodies are in the ground. Look, in L.A. area, we have two famously ginormous cemeteries, Rose Hills and Forest Lawn. 
I mean, they're beautiful. They're epic. They're famous. They're amazing. I've often, when I do funerals there, I've often wondered how cool would it be to be burying a saint for doing a service, put them in the ground. They've only been in there for like 10 minutes. <laughs> and a trumpet blast blows, and they pop right out. That, they're going to pop out first. I mean, think about it. Like toast coming out of the toaster, man. <laughs> Boom! And, then, and, it, and the Bible says they're going to arise, and then we who are alive and remain, look at it with me, we who are alive and remain, the Scripture tells us, shall be caught up. Verse 17, there's your word rapture. In English, it's two English words, caught up. Harpazo in Greek. Earlier today, Amir mentioned the Italian prophet Malachi. Malachi. I have to admit, harpazo sounds like something you'd get in Italy. I'd like to have a Coke and two harpazos with extra sauce. A harpazo. Harpazo is the catching away of the saint right here in your Bible. Or if you have a Latin Bible, the word rapture is there. Caught up, the Bible tells us, together with meet, to meet them in the clouds. Listen, to meet the Lord in the air. Do you remember Colossians? We're going to meet him in glory, in his appearance. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Verse 18, therefore, argue about this. Tear yourself up and worry. Be fretting about this. No. Isn't it sad? Can I say can I say, I'm not allowed to say this back home. Stupid. My grandkids, won't, my grandkids won't let me say stupid. Listen, the Bible says that the rapture hope should be a comforting conversation. It should be a wonderful, edifying truth that we should comfort one another with those words, Maranatha. That's what we used to say, Maranatha, the Lord cometh. And people would go, oh, I'm so comforted by that. Now people get in fights over it. Let's debate, it. Let's, let's debate this. Let's argue it. Go ahead. I'm just going to be excited about his coming. 1 Thessalonians 5. So this is the final one in that, uh, that 1 Thessalonians writing of Paul. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to deliver us from the wrath to come. And by the way, mark it down, please. The wrath is not Three and a half years, the latter end of the tribulation period. Don't let somebody dupe you. They say, well, if it's the last three and a half years, that's all this flame and fire and demons going everywhere and all this. This is true. But the whole seven years is a judgment period upon the earth. And the whole seven years is God repurposing Israel in that seven-year tribulation period. The seven-year tribulation period is specifically Jewish for a reason. The book of Daniel makes that incredibly clear, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. It's Jewish. By the way, if it were Gentile in the Gentile church, why is it that in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, you have the book of Revelation being spoken to uh, churches in that book, spoken to by Jesus himself, and in Revelation 4, verse 1, John is seen being caught up into the heavens, and the church never again appears in the book of Revelation until she's seen in heaven in Revelation 19. Question to the skeptic and the doubter, how'd she get up there? How'd she get there from chapter 3? No, we need to go through the trip. We've got to power up and go, mark. Well, then why doesn't the book of Revelation give us survival tactics during all that tribulation period? How come it, why isn't it in there? The church is on earth being spoken to. John says he's caught up and he sees heaven, by the way, and he sees a host of people from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. How'd they get there? And when, when the doors open up in Revelation 19 and Jesus is returning in the second coming, how in the world is it that the church is riding behind him on white horses? In a, in a, she, the church is amazing. Read it carefully. She's on white horses. That's us. And, 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 and fine linen, clean and white, which is a wedding gown, but she's called an army. She's quite a woman, I'm telling you. She's got, she's got a wedding gown on, a couple of hand grenades on her hips. She's got a, a grenade launcher, so it is. She's an army in heaven coming with him. And the Bible tells us that we actually don't do anything. We're just behind him. And the Bible says that out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, and with it he will strike the nations of the earth. How'd she ever get there if there's no rapture? Hey, real quick, hopefully this is going to work out. There's a perfect doctrinal agreement of John 
of what he's saying to what Paul is saying in Thessalonians. And I'm wondering if we can see it. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going to read this parallel. Write it down. (laughs) Write it down. I need you to write it down. I've worked hard on this. I want you to work hard now. Come on. (laughs) So watch this. John 14, 1 to 3, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. John 14. Watch. Troubled. Thessalonians, grieved. John, Jesus is speaking. Believed. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, believed. Next, Father. Jesus is speaking regarding him and the Father. In Thessalonians, it's Jesus and the Father. In John's Gospel, he told you. In Thessalonians, I say to you, or by the word of the Lord. Number five, in John, it speaks about Jesus coming again. And in Thessalonians, it's Jesus Christ or the Lord coming back. In John's gospel, he'll receive you or receive us to himself. In Thessalonians, that happens there by being caught up. There in scripture, uh, number seven argument is that we are received to him, to Christ. And in Thessalonians, we meet him in the air. And then in John, Jesus comforts us and says that where I am, there you may be. And in Thessalonians 4, you will always be with the Lord. There is a perfect eight-piece correlation between those two books with exact accuracy, speaking about the same exact event. Number two in our study today, as we look at what you believe about the rapture matters, is hope. It matters because the rapture is the believer's hope. It should bring hope to you. Not church splits or divisions. It should bring hope to you, not an argument. It should bring hope if we would only read our Bibles. And that verse we opened up with in the second chapter of Titus, verse 13, Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope. The rapture was in Paul's day and in the first century it is And it will always be the blessed hope until it happens. In fact, it's the blessed hope, and we're waiting. The moment it happens, it will be that hope realized. God is going to fulfill his word. He's promised to do that. Paul the apostle, mark this down. This is a huge argument regarding Paul and his desire to be raptured. Listen up, everybody, because that's, listen, what I'm going to say, it's a, it's a big deal, unless you see it in the Bible here. You got to see it in the Bible If you don't see it, then Jack's just spouting off, and I'm not going to do that. Watch this. 2 Timothy chapter 4. It is awesome. Paul knows he's going to die now. It has been revealed to the Apostle Paul he's going to die. Notice what he says in his last will and testament. These are your last words. He's going to die in Rome. Go to Rome. Go to the Mamertine prison. It's preserved. It's there. The prison. You can go to see where Paul's last place on earth was. And this is what he said. By the way, it's very moving. He wrote 2 Timothy 4. He writes 2 Timothy. He writes it. No doubt he would have handed it through the grate up to the street to probably Luke. Hands it to him. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. That's how a believing Jew says, my time's up, it's over. I'm not walking away from this. And the time of my departure is, is at hand. I have fought the good fight. Notice it's all past tense now. First time Paul the Apostle has ever spoken about himself in a past tense. I have fought the good fight. Translation, my fight's over. I finished. I finished the race. I'm not running anymore. I've completed. I'm done. I've kept the faith. Oh my goodness. That's, aren't you living for that? Listen, Unless Jesus comes back, you're going to lay your head down on on your pillow someday and you're going to look into your family. You're going to say, you know what? I have fought the good fight. That's on my father-in-law's tombstone in Orange County. I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I finished my course. That's what we're all supposed to be living for. Listen to what he says. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only me only, but also to all those who have loved. He, that's it. Who have loved his appearing. 
It wasn't until Paul knew he was going to die. Up until that point, he was saying things like, we who are alive shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. What a blessed hope we have, Christian. If Jesus doesn't rapture us out of here, don't worry. If you rupture, he's going to be holding your hand in that moment of death. Rapture or rupture, Christ will not abandon you. He'll be with you forever. Number three, what you believe about the rapture matters because the rapture is the great motivator. The great motivator. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know this, that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Christian, the fact that Jesus Christ could come back today should cause you to run for office. No, no, I'm not joking. I get in trouble a lot because I'm, I'm super ready for Jesus, poach, uh, po preach, rapture, ready to go, and then I'm involved in issues of government or Washington, D.C., and friends scratch their heads and they say, what are you even here for? You believe in the rapture. Why don't you just go home and wait? Have you noticed, if you know anything about church history, the ones that have made the greatest impact in church history in 21 centuries are those who believe that Jesus could come back at any time? Go look at your uh, church history. It's a fact. Listen, yes, I believe Jesus can come back today, but that's why I'm going to encourage people at our church to run for governor, to run for Congress. Why? Because you know what? I don't know when he's coming, and I'm going to occupy till he comes. I'm going to encourage as many people as possible to do righteousness because that's what we're supposed to do. I want to be so heavenly minded that I am earthly good. Don't let anyone ever say, oh, man, you Christians, you're going to what, wear a white robe and sit on your roof until Jesus comes back? No, I'm going to run for PTA. Get involved. Get new congresswomen and congressmen and get, new, get a new mayor. I mean, I don't know. I don't know your mayor. You might have a good mayor. I'm just saying. I'm not saying this mayor here. I'm just saying a mayor where, wherever you live. So I don't like that person. They're antichrist. And they, then run for office. Do it. Well, we're not supposed to. I don't know. That's political. My entire Bible's political. David was a king. Isaiah addressed the king. Jesus is a king. Paul the apostle invoked his Roman citizenship and went to Rome and gave the gospel and a peace of mind to Nero. Listen, use your citizenship in America. We saw today by that awesome presentation regarding the infiltration of our schools and our government by Islam. They know what they're doing. Why don't we do it for the truth? Mark Twain says a lie go goes around the world twice before the truth gets its shoes on. We need to get out there for the truth. I'm off topic. It's a motivator. That's what I'm trying to say. Jesus could come back today. That's why I want to get involved tomorrow. Because if he doesn't come back soon, I got grandkids that are going to inherit this nation. I love this country. Everybody's beating up on America. You know what? It, this, this, this nation's messed up. It's still the best messed up place in the world. Did you know that? It is. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I'll tell you what, I don't know of any other country in the world where people are trying to break into it. It should motivate you. Okay, I may need a card to sweep me away after this next statement, but I know many of you from the emails and the phone calls and the conversations we have that many of you don't have good churches in your community. Uh, you, you need to ask God to change that. I believe it's God's will that a good church be in your community. So listen, if you can't change the one you're in, then start gathering together, get people together, if you don't know what to do, then you know what? Turn, turn on the switch. And you've got a myriad of great Bible teaching available by all kinds of wonderful people. Some of them are here today in the front row. And you can get people together like people are doing across America. And they'll sit down and they have Sunday service with us. But they might have Sunday service with us on a Monday night. Because they go online and they'll get around and they got the food and they got the popcorn or whatever they're doing and they have time together and then they sit down, they have worship and they have church in the home or church at the community center. But by all means, do church and here's the reason why. 
You can't give up. You can't stop. Here's the motivator. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and of good works. Verse 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Listen, if you can't go to a Bible teaching church in your community, get Bible believing people and gather together and go, to the, go through the word of God together. But by all means, don't stop gathering together. Please, listen, don't stop it. It's, it's certain ruin if you give up. Don't do it. Some people get upset at us back home. Listen, I'm dead serious. When we started live streaming, we didn't know what we were doing. So we started live streaming. And in the next couple of Sundays and Wednesdays, there's hardly anybody at church. <laughs> so what's going on? So I made an announcement. <laughs> I said, where are you people? And the ones I said it to who were sitting there, they were the good ones. <laughs> so I said, hey, those of you who are out there, out there, out there, out there, <laughs> we're going to pull the plug, pull the plug, pull the plug. <laughs> and we did. The, the technology people at church, they put a 15-mile cone of silence and I got hate mail. I, listen, Christians were so upset, they were threatening me. I can't believe it. I, we were laying in bed watching, watching TV, having church. No, no, you were laying in bed watching church, but you ain't having church. You can't have church unless you have to deal with people, sit down, deal with the parking. That guy took my seat. He didn't say hi. How come I didn't get that one? That's church. You got to get in it. You got to get in it. It's a mess. <laughs> church is a mess. Anybody can be, watch church with popcorn in bed. You got to get up and get in the mess. I don't like that guy. I don't like this woman. She drives me crazy. That's where you're supposed to be. <laughs> Come on. You got to rub elbows and you got to get, you got to do it. You got to do it. Don't stop giving, don't stop going to church. Oh, I hear you, but you got to do it. Number four, number four, listen. Rapture should promote holy living. Jesus is coming back. Seek those things that are above, as we saw a moment ago. But look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. By the way, my dear Catholic friends, Christ was offered once. No, no, to bear the sins of many. Jesus, was, Jesus only suffered once. He doesn't suffer at every sacrament or every communion service. He only suffered once. Jesus, Jesus suffered once on the cross, never to suffer again. Your, your, high, your priest is in heaven. Your priest is Jesus Christ. He suffered for the sins of many. Listen, there's, listen, there is a... Uh, Caveat to this, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Are you eagerly waiting for him? Does the thought that Jesus could come today excite you? Let, yeah, let's be honest. Let's feel really honest about this. That the thought of him coming, if you, if you start to backslide, you know, love should keep you going, first of all. It's your love. You always want to pray, Lord, cause my heart to love you more every day. Don't let me grow cooler. Let me grow hotter in love for you, Jesus. But if anything goes cockeyed and weird with my heart, you get a hold of me, Jesus. If that doesn't do it, may the fear of the Lord keep me out of trouble. All right? If that doesn't do it, may the sheer terror that you could come back and I'm involved in something I ought not to be keep me out of trouble. You know, sometimes we need a little bit of an admonition, you know, and an exhortation. Kids are like that. Look, Junior, do it because you love me. Well, you get the attitude. Okay, then do it because I told you to do it. And that doesn't do it either. Then look at Junior and say, if you don't do it, <laughs> no cookie for you. You know what I'm saying? You want to do it out of the right heart, out of the right drive. Number five, I'm going to speed up for time. It matters because the rapture is the great separator. The rapture is very clear in the Bible. It separates. Listen, 
the believer from the unbeliever at the time of the rapture, a world is separated. And this is where a lot of people who argue against the rapture, they get all sweaty with this one. Let me tell you something right now. The rapture is an event in the Bible. We saw that in a few scriptures. It has its purpose and its motive and its, and its reason. And I'm submitting to you today that one of them is that it's a separator. Why would God separate his people from a Christ-rejecting world? Listen, according to the book of Isaiah and according to the book of Revelation, there are those who are called earth dwellers. I love the old King James calls it earth dwellers. Those who dwelled on the earth, they, the hailstones, the fire, all this stuff's written in the Bible. But it has nothing to do with the church. And it has nothing to do, by the way, with the believing house of Israel. In the tribulation period, they're protected by God. Remember, it's a Christ-rejecting world that is shaking their fist at God, the Bible says. And then, listen, instead of repenting, the scripture says, it says that they shake their fist at God and they hide themselves in the rocks and the cliffs of the world to shelter themselves from the wrath of the Lamb of God. They cannot believe. They refuse to believe. The Bible tells us that the rapture will separate us from an unbelieving world. Look, if you have a hard time with that, read your Bible some more. It's in the scriptures. It's going to happen. But look, I'm speaking to a house of believers. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, or Paul said, in a twinkle of an eye, we'll be caught up to meet the Lord. We'll be changed. That ought to excite you. If you don't get excited over that, I don't know. Something's interesting with you. That's weird. <laughs> Galatians 5.5 5 says, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That's a reference to his coming. His righteousness is coming. What a great thing. Number six. It matters because the rapture delivers us from that wrath we were talking about. Okay, get ready. Here we go. People will say, you guys, you know what? You just want, it's escapism. That's what you're all into. to. You just want to escape. Escapism. <laughs> Listen, I do everything I can to escape. For example, look, I live, in, I live in Southern California, one of the most expensive places in the world to live. Okay, I'll do anything and everything I can to escape having to pay full price for anything. Okay, Amir thinks he's Jewish. I'm Jewish. I'm not going to pay full price. I want a coupon. I want a deal. Escape. Listen. It's fun. It's, I, mean, I don't mean this in a funny way. It's ironic. It's funny. It's strange. People are trying to escape flooding in Houston. They're not standing there going, come on, water, I'm not afraid of you, bring it. <laughs> Listen, when an earthquake happens in Southern California, no one goes down to the beach. <laughs> why? A tsunami warning has been issued. So why? So you escape the tsunami. Anybody would know this. Well, listen to this. Luke 12, beginning at verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. Verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom, when the master, when he comes, will find them watching. Verse 40. Therefore you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Why? Because the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 21, off my head, it's coming, verse 36, I believe it is, that we're to be watching and waiting for him because if we do, we are going to escape all those things that shall come to pass upon the earth. The Bible even uses the word escape. Escape, sign me up. <laughs> you have to apologize for that. But listen, it's not because we're cowards. It's because God has promised us to spare us from the wrath that is going to be poured out. We're going to be delivered from that wrath. Number seven, it matters because the rapture belongs to the church. It is a church possession. Listen, the rapture from the scripture doesn't belong to the Old Testament saints. Listen, it doesn't belong to uh, the believing house of Israel. That's for later. 
The rapture of the church does not belong to the tribulation saints. They're not raptured. There's a certain group of believers that is designated for the rapture, and it's called the bride of Christ, the church. Think of it. Go study and see what the Bible says about that. It's exclusively belonging to the church. Remember what Jesus said in John 14. Do you remember what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4? Speaking to the church, the rapture. In Revelation chapter 4, you want to talk about it belonging to the church? We mentioned it earlier. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, John is speaking, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here. I like that. It's pretty amazing, too, that he said it's like a trumpet speaking to me. And uh, the word is, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place. What's it say? After this. So now we're in a chronology. Something's up. Verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and like a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne there were 24 thrones, and on the thrones there were 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne there were Four living creatures, this is freaky, full of eyes in front and in the back. Okay, that's freaky. The first living creature was like a lion. So it's not a lion, it's like a lion. What does that mean? And the living, another living creature like a calf. The third living creature was, or had a face of a man or like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. It's weird. It has one head, but with four faces. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. And this is what they say. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. The Bible says Jesus is the creator of all things. Revelation 19, verse 18. After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to our Lord God, for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Verse 3, again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne forever saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. As the sound, this is Revelation 19 now, remember that. The sound of, uh, sounded like many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Go find out who that is. <laughs> you need to know who that is because she's in heaven. She got there somehow. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. I had the high honor one time of asking Dr. John Wolverd in person, sir, it's interesting, they don't, they're not mentioned having robes, they're mentioned here having fine white linen. And he said, young man, that's interesting. That's all, that's all he said. It was, <laughs> look, from John Wolverd, I was honored, he said it was interesting. 
But isn't it interesting? She's got fine linen, clean and right. Go look at that. Find out what it is. You're going to find out that it's apparel that's in association to a wedding. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 11, now I saw him who opened, uh, uh, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judge and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Pause right there. Jesus in heaven right now looks like this. This is hard for us from Southern California because everything we have on our walls, every children's ministry coloring book has got Jesus looking like he just got off a surfboard. (laughs) He's got a great robe on. He's got windswept hair. It looks like a surf guy. He doesn't look like a surf guy. This is what he looks like. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. By the way, I'm going to submit to you that that robe was bloodied during the tribulation period. Think of it. And his name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen. There she is. She's an army dressed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness, and the, there's the word wrath. You've been hearing about it all day. The wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's awesome. That's Jesus. I thought you'd be excited about that. But anyway, number eight. Number eight, it matters because the rapture is the ultimate act of mercy upon us for God. It's an act of mercy for us. Let's be honest. Do we deserve hell? Yes, we do. His grace is what's going to get you into heaven. Do we not deserve to be disciplined at every moment? Yes, we do. Mercy. I'm going to submit to you today that number eight is the rapture is God's act of his ultimate mercy for the church. He gets us out of here before the world is punished for their sins. That's very important. Number nine, I'm running now. I'm out of time. I have one minute. It matters because the rapture is in the believer's DNA. Look, I'm sorry if I upset you, but if the Holy Spirit is doing it, then God bless you. But... I believe that the doctrine of the rapture of the church and the imminent return of Christ is the Holy Spirit's imprint of the DNA of the Spirit in the life of the believer. I cannot imagine a Christian reading the Bible and then saying, well, I hope the Lord doesn't come back soon. I don't understand that. That's number nine. And number 10, I end with this. Only the rapture and the doctrine of it answers the teaching of expectancy in Scripture. Listen. Listen. Quick, I end. Are you ready for this? Book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, gave the Jewish people an outline for the coming of the Messiah. The book of Daniel is the book that says, in the 483rd year of Israel's special dealings with God and God with Israel, there's 490 of them years. At the 483rd year, the Messiah would come to Israel. Did you know it says that in the book of Daniel? You say, I've never heard that before. Just hang on. It says it. The same next sentence in Daniel 9 says, but the Messiah will be cut off. The word is karat. He he will die. The Messiah of Israel will die. Every Jew knows this. It says it in Daniel. Fast forward. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Do you remember what he said? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who stones the prophets who are sent to you. How often I would have gathered you together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Here's the indictment, but you were not willing. 
So now behold, your house is left to you desolate. You will not see me again until you say to me, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When, did Jesus, when was Jesus crucified? What, what year was that? Jesus was crucified, died, and rose again from the dead on the 483rd year of a 490-year prophecy. God promised 490 years to Israel. On the 483rd year, Jesus dies exactly what Daniel prophesied in Daniel 9. Jesus' first coming to Israel was on Palm Sunday, not Bethlehem's birth. He expected them to know the day of their visitation. He said, because you didn't recognize the day of your visitation. Now all peace is gone from you. They should have gotten up that morning and looked at their calendar and said, based upon Daniel, today's the day the Messiah comes to the nation of Israel. That's the first physical coming of Christ to the nation of Israel. It happened on the, te on the Temple Mount. Or excuse me, it happened on the Mount of Olives. Jesus went to the Temple Mount, declared himself that week to be who he was, and the people didn't receive him. The second coming of Jesus Christ to Israel. Where does he land? Where does he put his foot? Mount of Olives, same landing course. He goes through the eastern gate. He goes to the Temple Mount. He establishes the throne of David from the Temple Mount location because we believe in the millennium. Jesus has never sat on the throne of David. He must do it. And I submit to you today that the book of Daniel told the Jewish people his first coming in that book. And the Bible tells us in Daniel the second coming. It's a Jewish thing. In the middle is a thing called the rapture. It's not a coming. It's an appearing. In the atmosphere to meet him in the air. And he will take you there from that point back to where he's been preparing that is the blessed hope. That is the truth of the gospel. It's there, and that's why we believe it. We don't believe it because we want it. We believe it because it's there, taught by Jesus in exact correlation to all other biblical references, Old and New Testament alike. What a blessed hope. What you believe about the rapture matters. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this gathering. Bless Jan and her boldness. And Father, all those in this gathering today, wherever they go, may they go out of this place at the end of this day like embers ablaze to go to their communities and catch fire, that they might burn the light until we see your coming for us as individuals, but more hopefully, even now. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Thank you. Say, when our times get dark, in fact, when they get perilous as they are today, we need hope. We've just spent an hour considering what the Bible calls in Titus 2.13, the blessed hope, the any minute rapture of the church. To be a part of this, you must be a believer. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Make him Lord of your life. Escape the coming wrath upon the earth known as the tribulation and look forward to an eternity with our Savior. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week. Jesus Redeemer, we have taken a break this week from the tide of our times to consider the future and the any moment rapture of the church. Let us hear from you through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763 559 4444. That's 763 559 4444. Or write to us at Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. Remember, we still have complete CD and DVD sets of our 2019 conference, which hosted today's message. And don't lose heart. God always has things under control. He will never leave you or forsake you. And everything is falling into place.